Welcome back everyone. I'm going to pick back up with more work on the press today. So the, um, as you can see I'm outside here because I'm going to do a little bit of torch work and it's a really really nice day out so it's easier to do it outside instead of film the shop up with smoke. Hopefully the wind background or the wind doesn't create too much background noise. So um, we'll get right into it. The pieces I'm going to cut out are the the mount for the ram, the, the portion that the ram is going to push against at the top of the press frame. So I just got this torch set up here. Uh, I'm going to use that little sleeve that I made in back in the trailer to run along on a guide. So we'll get these pieces cut out and then do a little bit of weld prep on them and get them installed. Popping your hearing means that there's one of the O-rings that's leaking a little bit, so I need to pull the torch apart and replace the O-ring. Okay, so I'll get those cleaned up and do a little bit of weld prep on them and bring you right back to show you how they're going to get installed. Okay, so I got those pieces um, ground down a little bit, weld prepped. Um, what I did here is I created two pieces. One of them, I'll scoot you over here. One of them sits down inside of the channel in between the two pieces and the other sits on top so um, it gets kind of a double thickness there and also you can see how so the first one will get welded in good and then I'll lay the second one over top of it clamp it in tight weld the second one around this perimeter. So we'll end up actually with uh, three quarters of an inch that has lots and lots of weld area on it. So it's um, given that's only spanning across three inches in here, um, 20 ton easily should hold up against that. As far as attaching the ram, uh, the ram is just a completely blank ram. So during pressing operations, it's going to be pushed up against this plate. So there's really no need to secure it against any kind of significant force. Really the only thing you need to do is just hold it up in place. So what I'm going to do, here's the ram here, what I'm going to do is drill and install two three or, uh, quarter inch studs. That bottom plate of that ram is almost, it's like seven eighths of an inch thick. So I'm going to drill in about half of an inch or so, maybe five eighths. That will let me install two studs in there. And then in the mating plate, I'll drill those same holes through here. And then I can just put a nut and washer. I won't even actually tighten them down tight because that'll let it float a little bit. And then when you press on it, it'll just push it up against the plate. And basically all the quarter inch studs do is keep the cylinder, the ram from falling down. So I'm gonna go over the drill press and set that up and get those holes drilled and make sure that it fits the plate and then I'll get to get busy welding the plate in. I'm going to use a quarter 28 studs at least on the portion that's screwed into the the ram so for a quarter 28 that's a number three tap drill so it's that's small enough that I really don't need I'm not going to really worry about a pilot hole
and there is a there's a, on most like on most dural presses there's a graduated scale on the quill feed side so that's how I'll determine that I'm going to go down the five eighths of an inch. Well, that's either really tough steel or that drill bit's pretty dull. So I'm going to go over and touch up the edge on the drill bit, and then we'll see what happens. All right, let's see how that goes now. Okay, so here I'm just going to... Sorry, I probably forgot to tip the camera down. So here I'm just drilling the hole in the, um, the plate, matching holes in the plate, including a center hole, because there's a bleed on the top of that cylinder, or the top of that plate. Alrighty, got those drilled. I'll actually be able to use those once I put the first piece. I'm going to leave them clamped together tight like this. I'll lay it down in there, tack weld the bottom piece so that way it's uh, the top of the bottom piece is plumb or flush with the top of the cross members. Then uh, cut the welds loose. I've got a V, v notch shot so I can really weld that one to have you. Then I'll put this plate back on top. I'll actually use those bolt holes to clamp them together really tight and then weld the top one. So let me get set up for that and I'll bring you right back. Okay, so I've got the piece set up there, tacked in place. Let me kind of show you where I'll be. Um, so I'm going to tack weld the lower plate right there in each corner. On all four sides, that'll hold it in place. Then I'll pull the top plate off, and I've got a V-notch ground in there so that I can lay a big heavy bead in there. And once that piece is, that lower piece is welded in, then I'll come back, knock off any high spots on the weld on this plane, put the next plate down, use the bolt holes, to sandwich the two pieces together, and then weld in this top cover plate. That'll give me three quarters of an inch of
going going anywhere. Give you a look at it here. So, um, that pretty much does that part. Uh, next, I'm going to start on the, I guess, the tables and machining those pins that hold the uh, hold the table two halves separated apart. So I've got to dig around and see if I've got. I think I've got some one inch cold roll, but if not. Um, well, it might be a couple days before I can get into town and get some. So come on back for that portion of it, and we're getting pretty close to being finished up. I did have some one inch uh, cold rolled round, uh, just enough. So I'll swing you around here. I'm gonna cut off four pieces of that, and then we'll go over to lathe and get, uh, get a machine. I know I keep saying how much that cold saw is a game changer, but as you can clearly see, that's a one inch solid bar. It just cuts and zips right through those. So uh, let me get you moved over to lathe and we'll get them faced off. All righty, I'm just gonna face off each end of the pin. I cut them a little bit long, or the spacers I should say, they're not pins. I cut them a little bit long, uh, finished length um, I want to be six and three sixteenths so I cut them at six and a quarter so I'll just face the first end until it cleans up on all four chamfer them and then swing them around and cut them to length. All right, so what I did there was um, I scribed the first one, put some Sharpie on the first one with the dial caliper, set my overall length, made a small scribe, and I just now turned that first one to that overall length of six and three sixteenths. And then so I can repeat that, I just put a dial indicator on the way and zeroed it. So now, and there's just the stop and the chuck. Um, so each time I put it in there, I can work my way down till I'm back at zero on my dial indicator and that will ensure that they're all the same same length within a thousandth or so. And I'll chamfer them afterwards so that I'm not potentially inducing any error by changing out um, the tool.
Okay, what I'm going to do in these next several steps is to center drill all of the shafts on both ends, then drill with a tap drill for a half inch national fine and then tap both ends and that will facilitate the spacers being able to be bolted in in between the two cross tables. This of course gets done to all four pins so I'll um, jump ahead so you don't have to see the repetitious process on all three pins. Right here I'm just doing a quick chamfer as a lead in when I get ready to tap these. So here I've got a half inch tap set up in the tail stock. Um, that way it keeps the hole perfectly aligned and I'll power tap at least the first half inch or so to make sure it's aligned and then finish hand tapping. Okay, so I, now that those spacers are done, I'm going to set up the cross tables. I've got them down here on the drill press and drill those, drill the holes, half inch holes, where those spacer blocks or spacer pins will bolt in. So basically I've stacked them together. I'm going to do it as a kind of a gang operation. Um, I set them up with a precision square to where the surf, this is the surface that material will sit on when you're using the press. So I set it up to where those are um, on the same plane and then clamped them together as two halves. And now I, mean, I did the layout to where the four spacer pins are gonna go and be through bolted. So I'm just gonna drill through all those, those four spots with a pilot bit and then a half inch bit. And then that will let me bolt them together. Um, there'll be a little bit of play probably in the hole. So I ultimately won't torque those down until they're sitting in the press and sitting down on the pins that support the table. Then I'll do the final tightening on those bolts. Looks like the battery's getting low on the camera, so I'm gonna, you've seen three holes, I'm just gonna do three on the other end, and then I'll bring you back for assembly. All righty, I got those other holes drilled um, that I just talked about, and um, I did a little bit of additional stuff off camera that I'll get you caught up on. So given I'm pretty close to the assembly, I need to bolt the two tables together using uh, these threaded spacers that you saw me make. So, um, because it clamps in from both sides of the press's frame, I have to actually have them on the frame when I bolt them together. And I didn't have um, pins yet. So, if you recall, I drilled those 
holes in the main frames that support the table um, a little bit over 7 8 because the pins are 7 8 so 7 8 isn't isn't a extraordinary odd size but it's not super common and so I didn't have any um, 7 8 stock here and given the steel supplier I had been using for years um, shut down the whole kind of the retail store that they had where you could go buy go in and buy half sticks or shorty pieces things like that now the only thing you, I could buy from there is full 20 foot, 20 foot sticks and so 7 8 inch diameter cold rolled round bar doesn't get used very often so I really didn't want to have to buy a 20 foot stick of that just for um, these two pins need to be about 10 inches long so I took a few minutes this morning I had plenty of one inch stock on hand so I took um, a few minutes this morning and I went ahead and uh, turned those down to uh, got a pretty good finish on them turn those down to to the 7 8 diameter and so that um, that lets us see the holes stand by here for the compressor to quit so I've got to assemble those on the press frame itself so I was about ready to do that and then I decided uh, I actually had it in the CAD drawing and I think I'm going to go ahead and stick with that because if you look down here on the the cross table pieces on this one you can see this got a square cut in which would work just fine um, but in the drawing I don't know how much you'll be able to see the soapstone mark but in the drawing I had this because the uh, the frame of the main frames kind of go through this area so these two cross, cross bolts and separator pins We'll keep it from moving left to right, and then I've got a smaller three-quarter inch pin out here. The legs shouldn't ever try to spread any, but that would capture them from being able to spread. So um, what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll this line here, you can kind of see, hopefully with the soapstone, uh, I'm going to bob that corner off, kind of give it, that's about a maybe a 70 degree angle there or something like that. I'll bob that off. And that'll just make a little bit nicer look here. Um, I was going to do it with the torch, uh, but then of course you have to try to touch it up with the grinder. So I think I can set it up in the coal side. I think there's enough depth that I can swing. Um, that's a, a really extreme angle. So this, you're, I'm going to lose a lot of the depth of cut when I swing it around there. So at any rate, I think I'm going to give that a shot. And I'll, if it does look like it's going to work or out, I'll bring you back and show you that cut. Okay, so I was going to set those two pieces up on the frame just to kind of check those angles on the ends that I was going to cut. And I noticed that um, I made a small error when I drilled some holes. So initially I wasn't even going to show fixing them, but I just, I guess it's uh, only fair to you guys to show if I do make a mistake to show that also because everybody makes them. So. When I laid out the holes, I'll swing you down here. When I laid out these holes for to hold those spacers, I measured the inside diameter of the two frames, um, laid that out, and I, I suspect what I did is one at one point I forgot to take into account either the bolt diameter or the thickness of these these spacer pins. Forgot to take into account. At any rate, I dr drilled two holes. Um, too close to the end. These two holes here. Um, and so what that means is that there's no way I would have been able to install the spacer pins. They would have hit the frame. So um, doesn't mean the piece is scrapped. So what I did is laid out the holes where they belong, redrilled them. They were actually exactly a half inch over. So that worked out well because I wasn't trying to move the hole over just half the thickness, which is if anybody's ever tried to drill a hole only halfway over, basically you're making an oval and the drill bit will always want to try to slide into the original hole. So it worked out to where it was a full bit width plus a little bit. So I was able to drill a clean brand new hole without it trying to fall into the old hole. And then I just welded the old holes up. Um, one thing that makes it really easy to weld the holes up is if you have a piece of copper. Um, 
I have this copper spoon. And you can buy these. They're really expensive. The handle's steel, but this, this shoe, I'm not going to touch it because it's hot. This shoe is made out of copper. And so all you do, I'll pan you down here. All you do is you just put it underneath the hole, clamp it in place with a pair of ice grips, and the molten weld will not stick to the copper. And so that lets you start out right in the bottom of the hole without the weld puddle dripping out the backside. You can just fill right in the bottom and then walk your way up to the top of the hole. So I'll move you in here a little closer. So it just lets me plug weld those in. Um, and then I'll just touch them up with a grinder. So, anyway, uh, I thought it was only appropriate to show you that we all make mistakes, including myself. So I'll finish touching up these with the grinder. Um, double check them to make sure they do fit this time. And okay, so I got it set up in the saw. And like I mentioned, four, uh, four of the cuts are going to be pretty easy because... I would, initially, I was thinking the angle was uh, like, a, again, probably a 30 degree one side, 60 degree on the other side. And I was thinking it was on the wrong side of this plane, so I was going to have to try to tip the piece out here, but I just wasn't paying attention. So it's 30 degrees based off of this long edge, so that the, the saw will easily do that miter. Um, it only swings to the one side, well, it'll swing to both, but I don't like taking big notches out of the fence, so I try to always just cut on one side, which is already, the fence has already been relieved for that. So when I do the other side, I'll just flip it. Should be able to flip it over and do it. So let's make this first cut and see how it goes. Since I don't want to flip the or turn the saw table, I just flip the piece over. Um, marks on there, so I'm going to transfer my marks and we'll see how that cut goes. Should go just fine. Okay, so basically, if I just split this line, it should come out in the same spot. All right, so we're about ready for some assembly, or at least some test assembly. I'll have some deburring to do. Put it in the camera frame. So these spacers, as I mentioned, they just sit down in here in between the pieces. So there we go. Let me 
to go turn the compressor off. Figures just as I got to the switch, it turned off on its own. So, I don't have them tightened up all the way because I'll probably paint these pieces separate, but they're snug up enough to hold it on the pins. So, you can see that it's just like a traditional press that sits on the pins. Um, those bars, there's enough movement left and right so you won't bind, um, yet it keeps it from being able to slip off the pins. It'll still slide up. Slide up and down just fine. Um, this third pin that I talked about, it will go in here. It's only going to be a three-quarter inch diameter spacer pin with three-eighths bolts. Um, the fit up inside is good. That's one advantage of cutting with the length on the lathe is they're all exactly the same um, dimensions, so they fit tight against all the surfaces. So that part is now done. I've got to pick up a quarter inch bottoming tap. I got to finish the um, bottom tapping and poles on the ram and then I can bolt it into place. And let's see after that, probably build a mount for the power unit or the hydraulic power unit. Um, a couple clips to hold the hose maybe and then I'll probably paint it. I think I'm, I'm thinking about um, been thinking about all the different Additional pins and V blocks and those kinds of things that you need on a press and that I have and they're always seems like it's just always kind of a Hodgepodge you're stacking them on top of the press or whatever. So I think I'm going to build a, a swing out tray um, I'll probably, since I can't weld it to the upright frames, because it would be in the way, obviously, then when you move the table up and down, I'll probably attach it to the table itself, and that way it just moves up and down with the table, and just have a tray there that all that stuff can go on. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, one more thing I've got to do is, uh, the table's not super heavy, but it would be nice to have it suspended while you pull the pins out, put them in the next hole down and lower it down, so I'm going to come up with a hand crank winch affair. I'll probably use a nylon strap instead of a cable because it lays nicer on a winch. So I'll work on, I haven't decided whether I'm just gonna buy a bolt winch um, to do that or whether I'll build one from scratch. But, um, so there's not a whole lot left. Um, this is probably gonna be more than enough content for the next episode. So I think I'm gonna go take a break and figure out what I'm gonna try next. One thing, uh, I'll show you guys. Maybe I touched on it before. I can't remember. Um, as I walked over to turn off the compressor, um, most compressors have an on-off switch, of course, on the compressor itself. But my compressor's upstairs in the mezzanine, so that's not very convenient. So when I um, installed the compressor and wired it up, I just put a contactor, a 220 volt um, contactor, over by the compressor. Um, and then here, when I leave the shop. Um, there's the regular light switch and there's this black switch here. That's why, I, I mean, I had it a different color just so it sticks out. That's actually the compressor. It controls that contractor. It didn't come on because it had shut off based on the pressure switch. So it's kind of handy when I get now, when I leave, anytime I shut the lights off, I get in the habit of automatically flipping that, um, extra switch off, which opens the contactor. And that way, if I would blow a line or something, the compressor doesn't just sit and run continuous. So thought I'd share that. All right, so I will probably see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and ring the bell. Thanks.